Uh, first, I, uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm very grateful to all of you uh, for having invited me. And uh, I'm, it's excellent to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I'm sorry that I wasn't part of it for the first half of the morning. It's because I'm very allergic to smoke, and so I really do thank everybody for not smoking for a little bit of time, because I realize that's an imposition. Uh, so thank you. Uh, when I came in, the discussion you know, was excellent, and I felt that I was the loser in having lost the discussion before that. Uh, and so it's excellent being with a group of young Marxists, leftists, uh, from different parts of Europe, particularly from the Balkans, and to, to discuss common problems. Uh, what I'm going to, I'm a Latin American historian. My name is Liz Dorr. Uh, you can probably tell, listening to my accent, that I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I've lived in, United, in the United Kingdom for about the past 25 years uh, in London, but I'm a Brooklynite at heart, uh, and by, by culture, definitively. Uh, I'm a Latin American historian. I've lived for the last, on and off, uh, for the last seven or eight years in Cuba, doing a research project collecting the life histories that is interviewing people in an oral history metho uh, methodology along with other Cuban researchers who I've been working with about their lives in the revolution. And particularly the book I'm writing right now is about young Cubans and how they uh, remember what their experiences were and how they assess the revolution. Um, but I first proposed a paper on that, but Annie and said that didn't fit exactly with your what you do. Could I do something on Latin American integration? And so from a Cuban perspective, um, I know something about this very uh, idealistic, uh, very still somewhat uh, more plans and hopes than reality of a Latin American integration um, program, a Latin American integration uh, system. And so I'll be talking a little bit about that. When I say a little bit, I'll be speaking briefly, and partly the little bit is because it is so far more hopes and plans than reality. When you ask anybody or when you read articles about it or ask people who are involved in it, they say that it's more, uh, not that much has happened yet, except there's one very important aspect that has happened yet, and that is a petroleum trade within the countries involved. But beyond that, it's aspirations. And so therefore, my talk will be somewhat brief. Um, this organization is called ALBA, the, the Bolivian, or Bolivarian, as of Simon Bolivar, the 19th century sort of Latin American father of, of independence, the Bolivarian Alliance for Latin America, and now they've added for the Caribbean, because so many of the countries in it are in the Caribbean. And part of it is also what's called a people's free trade, uh, or a people's trade treaty. And so this organization, which is it's an integration organization, but it has virtually nothing in common with the EU integration uh, instruments, plans, uh, requirements, etc. The only thing that it has in common is this idea of political and economic integration. Beyond that, there is very little in common. Because the Latin American ALBA, as I'll be referring to it, which means in Spanish dawn, like you know, the dawn of the new day. Um, and so the dawn is the idea of a dawn of a sort of a Latin American independence to some extent. Because it was its founding, which was around 2004, <coughs> coincided with when the United States was planning a Latin American integration uh, free trade area called the Free Trade for Area for Latin America. And that was under President uh, Bill Clinton. And that was very much in the uh, neoliberal uh, denationalization, liberalization, privatization model. And so at that time, uh, President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and then uh, President Fidel Castro of Cuba came together to, f to form the hopes, the aspirations, of a free trade zone for Latin America that would be different, that would be against the United States domination, 
uh, and that would have completely different principles. The principles of it were the idea of national sovereignty rather than uh, domination by the United States. Uh, the principles were also about reciprocal cooperation. Uh, also the idea that the things like health care and education would certainly not be privatized, but they would be uh, delivering people's needs. Uh, so there was the idea of you know fulfilling basic needs of the population in the countries that would be involved. Uh, so the principles were very much opposed to the principles that the United States was then trying to gather countries into their free trade area. Uh, what the United States free trade area fell apart. There is one important one, and that's called NAFTA with Mexico and Canada, which is very much a functioning free trade area. But the one that the United States wanted to uh, to expand into Latin America never really happened. Uh, and partly the reason why it was a fiasco uh, was because in Latin America, it's one of the only areas of the world, I think now, where you have more and more progressive governments. You now have something like 12 governments which are sort of social, social centrist, social democrat, leftist, to, to uh, <coughs> Chavez, who calls himself uh, 21st century socialism, and in Cuba, which was a traditional you know, Marxist-Leninist socialism, but is moving somewhat away from that and not so sure exactly in which direction they're moving. Um, and so that as more and more countries were moving into this more social democratic uh, area, political area, they were rejecting the domination by the United States. And so you actually had referendums in a number of Latin American countries over <coughs> whether to join the U.S. dominated free trade area, and the referendums were against it. Um, because in Latin America you have had uh, social movements, the social movements which were at the end of the 20th century and now in the early part of the 21st century, interestingly are not social movements built around uh, class. Pretty much, they're not social movements built around uh, working, working, pe uh, sort of working class politics. <clears throat> Much more in Latin America, they're social movements built around indigenous, that is, um, sort of the uh, native peoples of Latin America, and also about race issues. Um, those are the dominant social movements in Latin America today, and those social movements have quite a bit of. Uh, and obviously their class basis is very am ambiguous and they can't you know, go one way or another. But those social movements had, have tended to be anti-United States and have tended to push for a kind of uh, least centrist and, and sometimes further <coughs> left than centrist social democracy. And so it's because you have governments in so many Latin American countries that are representing this more left, leftist, we'll call it in a vague, sort of floppy way, leftist political uh, <coughs> perspective or political sort of uh, area, that you were able to build this ALBA, the, so the, uh, the uh, integrationist movement. So it started out in 2004 just with Venezuela and Cuba. And the basis then was very clear. It was based on petroleum uh, subsidies for Cuba. Cuba would have completely gone belly up if it didn't have massive petroleum subsidies from Venezuela. And the Venezuelan uh, oil company is a state-owned oil company. And uh, Chavez is basically a benevolent dictator through elections. He does get elected, but quite he rules in a very dictatorial way in Venezuela. We could say it's a kind of benevolent dictatorship, uh, as was Fidel Castro, a kind of benevolent and sometimes not so benevolent dictatorship. Uh, and so that the all the books that relate or the the scholars of Alba of this uh, integrationist project who are trying to figure out where the financial flows are, who's subsidizing what, and who owes what, and what are the debts. It's completely opaque, uh, because it's basically all dealt with out of Chavez's pocket uh, through the Venezuelan trade, um, petroleum organization. So it's very unclear uh, what are the uh, subsidies that are going on. Certainly, the, uh, the financial 
foundation of this entire integrationist project is from support by the Venezuelan um, Petroleum Corporation. And so this makes the whole project very, very uh, unstable. It's based on Chavez, and it's based on profits in the Venezuelan Petroleum Organization. So if Chavez either gets uh, <coughs> loses the next election, which is coming up in about six months, or, or if he dies, which is, there's all kinds of rumors about how ill he is, who knows, uh, that would definitely create tremendous instability. Or if the Venezuelan oil company doesn't have as, many, as much profits as they have at the moment, that would also create an instability. So it would be very difficult to say that this kind of integrationist uh, program, this integrationist project, is replicable. Because it's not really replicable, it's very sui generis. But the ideas behind it might be replicable. Uh, the fact that it exists is because of this particular circumstances right now. The ideas behind it is that the countries of the region, now there are eight countries in this integrationist, uh, four of them are significant sort of in terms of size and importance in Latin America, is Venezuela, Bolivia, with a, another progressive president, uh, Evo Morales, uh, Ecuador, with another progressive president, uh, Correa, uh, Cuba, now President uh, Raul Castro. Those are the sort of significant players in this integrationist uh, project. And then there's Nicaragua, much smaller, and then there are three very small Caribbean countries who aren't particularly interested in this anti-US, anti-imperialism, or progressive politics, but they need the oil. Um, if they didn't have the subsidy of oil from Venezuela, they would be seriously in debt. And so three more tiny, we're talking about tiny little islands in the Caribbean, have applied to join ALBA, again, because they need the Venezuelan oil. Um, and so what you have is you have, the, it, it's growing in terms of numbers of uh, countries in it. It now covers something like uh, 75 million people in Latin America, which is not insignificant. It's <laughs> important to note that other progressive uh, governments in Latin America are not interested in joining it. Uh, Brazil, Latin America is a major player, which also has a sort of leftist, what's called social democratic, not so leftist, centrist social democratic. They're not interested in joining it. The government of Argentina is not interested in joining it. Uruguay not interested in joining it because they don't want to be part of something that's specifically seen as anti-US. That's too polarizing for their kind of uh, more moderate politics. But what, what are the principles of, the, of this integrationist um, program, project? The principles are that countries contribute in what they have. So Venezuela is contributing a lot of what it has, and that is petroleum. <coughs> Cuba is contributing uh, doctors, nurses, teachers in particular. And began, interestingly, uh, about eight years ago when this began, these were sort of internationalistas and in that they were, Cuba wasn't charging. This was part of the, there's a uh, currency within this trade, uh, this people's trade organization, and the currency has a name, it's called the Sucre. Uh, it's, they don't exist, they don't, they don't have a real existence, they have a virtual existence, and no one can track down actually their virtual existence, but supposedly this, uh, these arrangements are based on the sucre, this, uh, this currency. But Cuba was basing it on the sucre, but then Cuba needed foreign exchange. It needed um, foreign exchange that it could use to buy things like food from the United States, which 80% of Cuba's food is bought from the United States, despite the U.S. embargo. And so Cuba now, instead of providing these services, uh, as a part of this sort of barter arrangement or the sucre arrangement in Alba, Cuba charges foreign exchange, hard currency, for these services. And in fact, it's very important, again, to keep the Cuban economy afloat. So Cuba's main earner of foreign exchange now is tourism, but its second main earner of foreign exchange are these services. And they're mostly medical uh, services and teachers who are sent uh, to countries of this uh, Alliance, but beyond also in other Latin American countries, and, and the Cuban government charges for it. So it's a, a state, but state to state contracts. Um, so it's partly this kind of 
countries contribute what they have. Cuba also sells uh, and probably contributes in this case through this Sucre uh, arrangement of the currency pharmaceuticals because Cuba is a producer of pharmaceuticals, uh, producer of textbooks for literacy campaigns. Uh, that, so that's what is existing now. Beyond that, there is not very much trade or barter now. It's petroleum, Cuban doctors and nurses and teachers. That's what's happening. Uh, the aspirations and the plans go much further. Oh, and a couple of the other aspirations have been uh, realized. They're, they have a uh, regional-wide media, uh, t TV and telecommunications and radio uh, system and a news service. All of this is funded by Venezuela, the Venezuelan oil company. Uh, they have laid fiber optics so that you can have faster communications throughout Venezuela and the Caribbean, and particularly in Cuba. They're not functioning yet, but they will be very soon. Uh, there are plans for the kinds of transnational corporations, both private enterprise and state enterprises, that would be just uh, sort of cooperative ventures within this trading and within this integrationist program. Uh, they, have, they don't have any that are functioning yet beyond the Venezuelan petroleum trade. That's the only one functioning yet. Uh, the other thing that they have, which I think is quite important, is that they do have a defense school, uh, a military school. And that is part of the idea that, that to, to oppose United States domination, they have to have a unified defense uh, capability. So there is a defense school. Um, there is a central bank uh, with plans to integrate the activities of various central banks, but that hasn't happened yet. And what's important is that in certain ways it's much more, well, it's not very much like the EU at all, but it has built in flexibility. So the idea for the future would be that you would have the national currencies and this Sucre, the regional currency. So the idea is not that the national currencies would disappear, it's that countries could opt in and opt out wherever it suits them. So it's a, supposed to be a very flexible arrangement. It's supposed to be not a straitjacket. In fact, it's looked to the EU as what not to do, as opposed to looking to the EU as a model. Um, <coughs> I think basically that's, what's uh, that's what it is, that's what it exists so far, and that's the aspirations for the future. So it's a very, uh, it's, it's the idea of having a progressive integrationist uh, <coughs> program and project, but it shows the difficulties of having, making that a reality, and without the Venezuelan oil it would be an impossibility. So I'll stop there. So I believe this Just one is a brief one. Is, is Cuba charging dollars for? No, Cuba doesn't use dollars anymore. Uh, well, you said hard currency. Yeah. Um, I have read quite a few. The, the main economist who's doing work on this is Norman uh, Giovan, who has a fantastic website. So if you want to try and find out something about it, he says that he has spent a lot of time trying to track down these arrangements, the financial arrangements, and he says it's completely Gervan. impossible. What's Norm? Gervan, G-I-R-V-A-N. And, and so what it, f Cuba, in Cuba's you know, published foreign exchange earnings for yeah. hard currency, this is number two. What exactly they're charging it Bolivia, is, yeah. Uh, I assume it is U.S. dollars, yeah. And the second question, do you know, you know, in, in I think it started in '50 when the European countries lost uh, trust in each other to trade in currencies. They had a clear bank which was established, which also had a virtual appeal you know, at the beginning of Europe in early days. And, and the, the principle back then was that you could go, your balance could go negative only to a certain extent, and then you had to start paying. So there was all kind of end of year clearing bank. You know, it's typical clearing bank yeah. for regional. Is there, is Sucre, do you know, does Sucre have anything like that? That you can run a negative balance and then later rebalance with services, not actually? 
again, this is something that Nor Norman Gervon, yeah. but most of my... So sort it's of opaque, basically. It's completely it's opaque. opaque. He okay. says he... And he's very sympathetic to this, yes. totally. He thinks this is wonderful. But he says there are some very basic problems, like all of these little Caribbean <coughs> countries, and Cuba, uh, the biggest country in the Caribbean, who are being sustained by Venezuelan petroleum, what's going to happen after, let's yes. say, 10 years? Right now, there's supposedly a 25-year period of grace. And then it's very, very soft uh, arrangements. And then after the 25-year period of grace, then they're supposed to be paying back at a 1% interest rate. Uh, so you can see it's soft. The last do you know the ownership of the companies that are doing the fiber optic and the telecom, then they're doing the media? Are they actually kind of joint boards of people from across countries in Alba? Uh, I think it's Venezuelan. It's because I thought it's Venezuelan. But I, I think it is Venezuelan, yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? I'm just curious how come that 80% of the Cuban food comes from the U.S., yeah. although yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, just... Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a great anomaly, and it's, it's not very well known either. Uh, it's because Cuba has never been f uh, remotely close to self-sufficient food production. Cuba was a monocrop economy where they were producing sugar. But uh, when the sugar prices were very low about 12 years ago, Cuba, the Cuban government made this disastrous decision, which they recognize in retrospect was disastrous, to close down the entire sugar economy. Uh, so then when sugar prices began to... They had actually... <coughs> all the uh, processing plants, they, they plowed up the fields, the processing plants, they you know, just turned into junk. Uh, and so now they are trying to rebuild on a more modern basis a very small percentage of uh, sugar for processing. But sugar Im uh, Cuba imports sugar now. It shows how drastic the situation has become. So sh Cuba has to import food, and always has. And the closest place to import food from is the United States, of course. And before 1959, before the Cuban Revolution, I think then about... 55 or 60 percent of Cuban food came from the U.S. For a long period it didn't. It was supplied mostly through the Comic-Con countries. Uh, and then in the early 90s, I think it was about 1994, about the same time as this free trade, U.S. free trade zone, uh, the, U the U.S. Congress passed a law saying that it was still, all, it was legal for the United States pharmaceutical companies and food companies to sell uh, medicine and, and food to Cuba under very, very favorable terms for the United States and very unfavorable terms for Cuba because Cuba has to pay in cash. Uh, and so, uh, so, so it's very profitable for U.S., particularly food producers. There are many food producers in the United States uh, that depend upon producing for Cuba, particularly, I mean, there are all kinds of jokes about this. You, if you eat chicken in Cuba, you know that it was, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, <laughs> produced in Tennessee or something like this. Uh, and so the embargo, where it suited U.S. producers, the embargo was, you know, they made huge loopholes in it. And for Cuba, on their side, it was still, I assume, uh, cheaper to, to abide by those arrangements and to import, you know, via Miami, very close. Uh, than to import food from somewhere else. So now, officially, 80% of Cuba's food is from the United States. Thank you. There's another question. Such a formula, it's I mean, I was, guess, I was trying to pull some connections between your, your, your talk and what's happening in Europe and, and trying to find parallels in some way. Mm. And specific, I'm trying to do the yeah. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have an anecdote I should share with you after this, but it's not appropriate. But there was, um, there were, <laughs> it's not inappropriate, it's just it's less formal. It was a colloquial tone. So if we think about, if we think about similar campaign, uh, like think of similar discussions, uh, I'm thinking particularly in, in the Balkans and, and Eastern, and to some extent Central Europe, former oh. Austro-Hungary, you can see two sorts of motivations for projects for integration. On the one hand, it is these economic questions, you know, how do we, compete with Russia or Germany or France, England, how do we compete with these stronger economies and by pulling resources, common markets, common trade agreements, etc. Et On the other hand, there's also another attempt to confront imperialism, which 
targets the national question and is much more about how do we live together, how do we use a project of integration as a solution to you know, a region of the world where uh, nationalities live alongside one another and that those tensions can be easily exploited by imperialist powers. Okay. So for example, if we think of the Balkans, the role of Italy or Austria in exploiting Albanian nationalism just before World War I, precisely in order to prevent Serbia from getting any kind of access to the Adriatic. Or, or again, today, you can see a similar sort of way in which, in which um, Macedonia, will be, will sort of the threat of Greece will be balanced for Macedonia to completely sell itself to, to US interests in the region, or uh -huh. Kosovo as well as a similar sort of situation. The fear uh -huh. of Serbian, a future Serbian invasion means that people are willing to, to do anything just that the United States and the European Union will continue to protect them. Uh -huh. And so I wonder if there's any kind of sense, or if you know, there are similar tensions that are, that are taking place in, that are trying to be resolved through this sort of question of integration in Latin America, or if, if imperialism has used the same kind of tools in the region. Up until, you know, yes, U.S. imperialism is definitely has tried to use those kinds of tools. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of nationalism among Latin American countries. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there is little uh, border wars are still breaking out and all kinds of, it's, a, it's an area of tremendous nationalism. And I think that even despite the fact that, you know, Cuban foreign policy for many years was called internationalist, and it was internationalist, in certain ways, Cuban nationalism is tremendously strong. Um, and I think that one, it's not enunciated in terms of this, uh, if you read through the uh, documents of ALBA, it's all enunciated in terms of cooperation and people-to-people um, -people benefit and human needs and things like that. But I think overcoming some of that nationalism is, is an effect. It's not a conscious uh, plan built into the documentation. It is some of the effect, yes. But, um, be, well, uh, because you do have a lot of Cuban doctors in a lot of these countries, but well, it's the five countries that are the main countries here, and in Haiti as well, in the... <coughs> it, but now with that I've said that, it also breeds a lot of nationalism, because on the one hand, Cubans are always critical when there's a Venezuelan doctor. Oh boy, they say these Venezuelan doctors, they're no good. We want our Cuban doctors. And I gather that in the countries where the Cuban doctors go, they are grateful to have a Cuban sort of medical expertise, but they don't want the Cubans. <laughs> so one, one thing that should go on, my reading of this documentation, is there should be more training. Uh, Cuba should be providing more training in you know, medical personnel. There is one Latin American medical school, two actually, in Cuba, where they train doctors from these countries, but it's still very small scale. And so rather, you should have training, you should have medical schools set up, set up by the Cubans. I guess it would have to be funded by the Venezuelan oil company because there's no other funding in this whole, pro in this whole program. There's no other, you know, money, no other dosh uh, to fund the training of doctors and nurses and teachers, but that's not happening and it's because Cuba is charging foreign currency. So they don't want necessarily that to happen either. So there are those kinds of contradictions that come into this. But I think still it does go some way to overcoming nationalism, that's the question you asked. Okay, thank you. Oh, boy, I want to make a couple of um, points uh, about compared to Latin America. I think it's quite an interesting question that you raised. One is, while there are these minor conflicts in Latin America, I think I'm correct in saying that there hasn't been a border change in, Latin, uh, in South America since the um, Ecuadorian-Cuban conflict, which I believe was in 1945? Ecuadorian-Peruvian? Ecuadorian-Peruvian. No, uh, sometime in the 1940s. I think it was basically what you're saying is true. Right. I think and there was a very minor border chain very recently between Peru and Chile, you know, some 10 miles or something. Uh, and, um, well, well, there continue to be uh, demands raised. Uh, the Bolivians are annoyed that they're, uh, that the, um, uh, their outlet, Bolivia once had an outlet to the sea, which they lost, I think, in 70, 1878 or something like that. Uh, but the point I'm so sort of staggering towards is there was something about Latin America that gave it at least a border stability, a country boundary stability that is not matched mm -hmm. in any other 
continent in the world. Certainly not in Europe, not in Africa, and not, uh, not, uh, uh, not in Asia. And it would be interesting to see why, um, uh, if there's any relevance uh, 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 there for um, um, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Balkans. Uh, the, the, the other one uh, like also referred to economic cooperation. The big issue, um, let's say, for those countries joining the Euro, and if there's thought about some type of economic um, cooperation in the Balkans, is capital flows. I mean, because um, it is unfortunately the case that uh, uh, what the European, what the Euro does overwhelmingly is uh, facilitate uh, uh, capital flows in, uh, in and out of the region. I mean, capital flows are much, much larger than the trade flows. Therefore, I would think, any progressive, um, first of all nationally, but any progressive cross-border arrangement, you have to have very strict capital flows. You probably, have, I would say, need to uh, uh, take over the finan your own financial sector in order to um, have those strict uh, uh, capital control. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or replies or questions? I have a question for the audience. Okay. I guess I can do that. Of um, because I, when thinking about this, um, I was wondering to what extent the Comic Con was a cooperative venture to what extent it was the uh, certain you know, ruling elites in Russia saying you produce this, you produce this, you produce this for our benefit? And I was trying to draw some comparisons, you know, between Comic Con maybe and Alba, and not knowing enough about Comic Con to really say there's some some basis of comparison there or mostly contrast. But I assume that you all know, must know a lot more about that than I do, the Comic Con side. I mean, I know that Yugoslavia wasn't in the Comic Con. Was it? No. no. But still, I thought you might know something about it. Yes? No? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no. Please. No, no, please, please. I basically don't know much about it, but since nobody else is there. But I know that, that they, uh, at, the same, at one point, uh, the Soviet Union also, um, there was a similar arrangement with energy supplies, like right? with the Soviet oil. Uh, and at one point, uh, uh, they started char uh, charging higher prices, uh, the Soviets. So they, uh, the original arrangement seems to have been along these lines. Mm -hmm. I, know, I'm, I, I don't know, this is mm -hmm. something I read, and that then pushed some of um, the other countries in crisis and, and make them opening, uh, uh, force them to open up towards the West. So, mm -hmm. so this is only uh, something I you know. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you can elaborate. Maybe I'm entirely uh, wrong on this, but this is what I've, what I've, what I've come across. Uh, but I think that there was different phases in the Comic Con also uh, evolution, and uh, uh, the, the, the question was, well, what is very different from Alba anyway is that the, the different economies which were involved in the Comic Con were not based on the market uh, orientation mainly and the, even the in international exchange among themselves um, were not based on, uh, on market, uh, uh, pure market prices but mm -hmm. it was more a bargaining on the, uh, what, what is called the butter, butter yeah. and, and, and using world market uh, as a, something uh, uh, of course to be taken in account in, the, in this butter, butter mm -hmm. but uh, not the directly. So mm -hmm. anyway, there was no, no idea to, to, there was a kind of division of labor which existed in that relationship of course is there also. But, uh, uh, the, 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 the Soviet Union was exporting its uh, raw material and, uh, and, and, and energy oil and so gas and so on uh, at uh, uh, so-called uh, so about the price which was an advantage in comparison to the world uh, uh, price. Then when they occurred in the international price, the change in the 70s, uh, 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 
it, it came into uh, a, a conflict also with the internal crisis in, 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 and uh, when there was, that is, uh, when you had the Gorbachev turn in the 80s, it was confronted to the fact that in 86, uh, in 86, the, there was a counter, uh, uh, counter shock uh, on oil, uh, that is, uh, after uh, an increase, there was a decrease. So the, 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 the kind of price that was exchanged within the Comic Con um, uh, was not so much uh, interesting uh, for, for the, the, the Soviet side, and they wanted more and more to try and use international pricing. And uh, so, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's not so much, uh, there, there are elements of mm -hmm. similarity, yeah. but it's, mm -hmm. we should elaborate more, much more comparison to, to say what was different also. Yeah.